Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luan Nigara. Luann has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luann brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. If you think your life is busy, get ready to meet Susan Winterstein of Savvy Interiors in San Diego, California. In addition to running her interior design firm, which focuses on remodeling and renovation, there is also Inside Savvy, her retail store, Savvy Giving by Design, her nonprofit, and uh, let's just add to it, she has five daughters and a husband. <laughs> I'm exhausted just thinking about her day. There is a ton that I could have talked with Susan about, but today we concentrated on her nonprofit, Savvy Giving by Design. It is truly fantastic what Susan and her team are doing. This is an awesome conversation with a remarkable woman. I'm going to take a second here to tell you about Kimberly Selden's Business of Design, and then I'll be right back to introduce you to Susan Winterstein. More and more clients are asking for flat fee or value-based proposals, and there is a way to budget properly for flat fee jobs, but it's not likely the way you've been doing it. You all know and trust Kimberly Selden and the business of design. And so when I tell you that she has the solution, you know I mean it. Her third book, How to Win the Flat Fee Game, is out, and Kimberly will guide you to creating a flat fee proposal that will satisfy your customers without destroying your bottom line or your self-esteem. Don't do another flat fee proposal before you learn about Kimberly's method. Hi, Susan. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Thank you, Luann. I'm so excited to be here, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share our story. I am particularly excited, and I know everybody's going, you know, you always say that, Luann. <laughs> but <laughs> but this, is, this is a special treat because you are – look, I, I realize I am saying – I say a lot of the same things, but you guys are just – just killing me with the things that you're doing out there. Like Aww. every single week I meet another designer that I'm just like, Oh my goodness, how do you do this? So in your particular case, Susan, it's not only that you have a, a tremendous design firm that includes, as I discussed in the introduction, a retail store a, a co general contracting arm of your business and the interior design, but you have fully developed what you what is called savvy giving by design and that i i am really truly overwhelmed and in awe of what you are doing there and i am not just saying that i have been looking at your facebook page and your youtube videos and your website and it's quite remarkable and it's not lost on me i you know veronica solomon casa Valora interiors you know she wowed me with her solomon project i know that that's that she does that there's other designers that are doing what you're doing i know right here pat valentine zib is a designer in new jersey and she is always involved in make a wish and helping and doing that but you actually have really turned it into a full-on nonprofit organization of your own with an extremely organized platform. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we, we like to think so. It is. It, it is like launching a whole other business. Yes. And so before we get into it in detail, tell me please a little bit about you you are a, a extraordinarily busy woman you have five children okay five girls no less yes <laughs> a husband <laughs> you have the retail store you have the interior design business and you also do general contracting as part of your projects so adding this whole other thing it, what what what's going on there what what drew you to do that susan uh, well, I'm extraordinarily lucky in that we've got a great uh, team. I've got several designers that work with me at our um, out of our showroom location, and uh, we do quite a bit of uh, design work, room design, and I got into remodeling a few years ago. And it was probably about two years ago that I uh, did my first room, which is kind of the savvy giving by design. 
And the story goes that we had a mutual friend um, on a social media page. I have several social media pages and had mentioned a GoFundMe account for a local family whose daughter was diagnosed with rhabdomyosarcoma. She was 14 at the time. And the standard uh, joke in our family is I don't cook. So when they were doing their meal train, I felt very inadequate because I said, <laughs> getting a meal for me is not going to help. So I had reached out and said, listen, what if, you know, we tap into our community of, um, you know, savvy and talk about getting some donations together and maybe kind of sprucing up her room. I mean, she's going to be in treatment for 42 rounds of chemotherapy for a mm. little over a year. And she's going to have a lot of downtime in her space. She had to drop out of school. She had to be homeschooled. And between her clinic appointments and chemo, she'd be recovering in her room. And as we all know, as with designers, you know, our bedrooms are kind of a sanctuary, right? We mm -hmm. want a place where we can go in and relax and heal and be comfortable and have a space that works well for us. So they said, yeah, let's try it. I had no idea what I was getting into. Okay. Um, as a designer years ago, I had started a local community page called Savvy Steals and Deals. And it was basically, I had heard you on a podcast a couple of weeks ago talk about sometimes things happen by accident. Right. I had no idea how this page was going to go, but I started it for my clients who were getting rid of past furniture and wanted to update their space. And I just couldn't stand the thought of them going to a, a dump or uh, because some of these pieces were beautiful and right. could be reused and rehomed. So I started this page as kind of a pay it forward opportunity for clients to give away their stuff or sell it kind of like a buy, sell, trade, um, and feel good that somebody else was getting a new piece. So I tapped into that community first before I had my group page for Savvy Giving. And the response was overwhelming. I mean, within a couple of days, we had raised over $6,000 to offset costs associated with redoing the room. Yay. And I had capped the page several years ago at about 1,500. I stopped letting people in. In fact, today we have 1,700 requests to join. Wow. And I have not allowed them to join because I take donations on that site um, to join. So to so the donations go to Savvy Giving for $50, um, and then people can get on that local site. And so we've had a lot of success with that, keeping it small and intimate. And then when we started doing the room, I thought, gosh, this needs a dedicated page, right? We need a group page where we can tap into our community members of Savvy Givers to help offset the cost of these rooms. So anyway, going back to uh, Casey's room, the first one we did, um, I looked at all my contractors and said, what can you help with? Can you do floors? Can you do paint? What will you donate? And all of them were so incredibly gracious and decided to donate their services and put in hard surface floors and put in, you know, new lighting for the room. And then I started reaching out to other vendors or a closet company, California Closets locally, uh, donates closets to every one of our projects, um, mm -hmm. regardless of how many we do, and uh, puts a built-in closet so we can eliminate the need for a dresser in a bedroom. And we did the first one and within a couple weeks and installed it and surprised her. She had no idea. I think I was most nervous. I did do a storyboard for her, and I, and I was more nervous presenting to her than any client I'd ever had. <laughs> Knowing that, you know, if she asked for something, I might have to say no, you know, oh, okay. that I can't, I can't, I don't think that's a good idea or, you know, and, and so I was so nervous and I remember just sweating and, <laughs> and talking to her and she picked out a few fabrics and she loved everything that we presented. And then I tried to keep a few of the elements a surprise so that she wouldn't know about it and she wouldn't, um, you know, get too worried. And when she walked in and saw her room and broke into tears and was so shocked, it was the best feeling ever. Oh it was goodness. just of those, your heart just soars because you know that your team has had an impact on that child's recovery. Right. You know that when they get home from the hospital and they feel crummy, that they get to walk into this beautiful space that has all of the elements that they wanted, you know, a comfortable mattress, hard surface floors, you know, a TV on the wall, a beautiful mirrored desk, window coverings that actually block out the light, right. you know, so they can and sleep in the net in the afternoons sleep. when they're not the well, day. right? Exactly. Or mm. soft lighting, a dimmer switch, you know, on a light when mom has to come in at midnight and give mm. you that, that last chemo dose or steroid dose. And you know that you don't want that bright light hitting you, you know, so all of those things and all of those thoughts went into planning that room, but the reveal, 
you just, yeah, how could you not do it again? You oh. know, how could you not want to go right. forward? Right. So I'm not sure if this is integral to the the story and the system because we're going to pull apart the steps because you went through from mm-hmm. idea to reveal. And of course, there's a lot that goes on in the in-between. And so right. this may not be integral, but I my we discussed this before we started the program, Susan, and I'm just going to share with everybody that you and I have discussed that we're going to really pull this apart because I know there are going to be designers out there that will go to your social media pages, your YouTube pages, and really be moved, A, to donate to you. I'm, I'm 100% certain of it. But B, there's yeah. going to be those individuals out there that feel like, I'd like to do this. And so we're going to really pull apart some of the details. And so where I'm going is I'm not sure Mm -hmm. if this is integral to it or not, but I didn't understand it. So let's just back up. When you were talking about the two, the different Facebook site and that it's closed and capped at a certain Mm -hmm. number. And I didn't understand why, because it seemed like that was the site where you were collecting donations and, and so forth. So I didn't understand why it's capped. So I think I'm missing the point of it. Yeah, no, um, it's a it's a really good point. So um, I'll say that on some level, I'm a little bit lazy and I don't like managing a lot of different social media sites. Um, I started a Stabby Steel site for the buy sell part. And when I tapped into them originally, so backing up just a little bit on what you said, I think a designer's relationship to their community is key in whatever philanthropic efforts you want to do for it within your design field. Having the social connections within your community and having a way to communicate with with people around you, you're basically, people have an inherent want. I think most people, they're more good people than bad. They want to help, right. but they don't know how. Right. They just need some direction of being told, this is how you can help. This is how you can have an impact. And I think we've been so barraged by different nonprofits and scandals that have gone on here and there and everywhere. And when you can connect to a community that's near you, that you have a relationship with, um, that's going to be key, in my opinion. So through social media, I was able to do that on our initial page. Okay. Now, on that initial page, I have only one rule, and that is be nice to okay. one another. You know, <laughs> it's like, a good rule. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not your mom. I'm not going to police you. I'm not going to make up a bunch of rules for this page. And so by keeping it small, I kept it intimate. And if you really wanted to be in in a part of this page, then you're going to be willing to donate. And if you want to donate, great. And if you don't, that's fine. But donate to be a part of this intimate group of people that are, um, that we had established a relationship with over time. And so can I just clarify while you're talking there? So what you're saying is that this is a group where each time you have a new project, a new child that you're working for, you ask these same 15, 1700 people to donate again, 25, 50, a hundred dollars. No, oh, okay. actually, actually, no, that's where it started. So when you know okay. how things start by accident, okay. that started by accident. <laughs> okay. My community prompted me to say, Hey, listen, this is a buy sell site. I'm going to tap into you guys for being givers. So these givers on this page might help you know, a homeless person get furniture for their house, or they might help a whole bunch of things. Um, Once I started Savvy Giving by Design, and once I started doing rooms specific for children that were going through life-threatening illnesses like cancer, I created a new page called Savvy Giving by Design, which is a separate group page, which is open, which is for everybody. And we've got about 2,800 people on that page. Okay. And so the Uh, initial springboard, really, the original page was a springboard for a specific page around our nonprofit. Okay. And the original page, you keep it at at the cap number so that you can manage it and keep it as a community and have a presence there as opposed to having 40,000 people. And I also understand, like you said, they're, they're there because they want want to be there as opposed right. to you just have a list of 40,000 people and randomly somebody says something and you have to address them and they're never going to come into right. the group again. Okay. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay. That's exactly right. It's really, I found that group pages for me um, and what we were doing were more effective than a public business page. And the reason is with social media, when you throw things out on Facebook, you know, you have to pay to advertise and get those 
uh, messages to people that you want your audience. Whereas in a group page, it's closed, which means that your aunt Bessie can't see what you posted in that page. They can see you're a member of it, but they don't know what you're talking about in that page. And so it creates a little bit more of a community because every time we post in there, it's showing up on their Facebook social media page. Okay. It's not, I don't have to pay to advertise to get that message across. So when people join the group, they're at liberty to come, go, stay, but they, they're they getting the messages. And that was super important to me when we're trying to do something so timely that people were actually seeing those messages come up on their group feed. Right. Okay. So that's also a very good point. If you just had an open you know, page for the Savvy right. Giving by Design, it might show up on your feed, it might not. But when you make it a group, it's going to show up. Okay. Exactly. And there's just more community involvement. And again, I go back to that one more time and why I directed you to that post earlier today is that to be able to highlight the people that are giving to our program and contributing and having that community respond and see it and say, oh my gosh, that's great. Um, or, oh, we love this. Or, you know, what a beautiful tribute. Um, it really gives you the sense that we're in this together. Right. We're all here to have this change and affect this change. And you're in this group because on some level, you think what we're doing together is important enough to be involved. Okay. And so that's why you're on this page. Okay. I like it. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. So now you run through the first project and of course, mm -hmm. the Lauren was her name, right? You said? Uh, Casey. Casey. Casey, I'm confusing fun. Lauren with yeah. the video I watched earlier, yeah. right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, so Casey's happy. Her family's happy, and you right. have goosebumps. I, I, right. I, I know. <laughs> I had goosebumps when you told me the story. <laughs> yeah. So, the thing is, you decide now. Let's do this again, and. Yes take us through. So whether the next project was one that you fully on organized or not, just take us to the point now, Susan, where uh, f how you find a child, how you determine, because of course now the need is overwhelming, I'm sure, what you can right. possibly keep pace of. So how do you go about qualifying and finding the family and the child and then the process of executing these in a timely manner? Uh, such a great question. When we first started out the first year, we were not a nonprofit. I was doing this basically um, as a community member and people that knew me and trusted me donated to a GoFundMe page. So I started a very basic GoFundMe campaign and I would go in, you know, other people would reach out and say, you know, we've got this other family over here. The cancer community and these warrior moms are very connected at our local children's hospital. So they all see each each other at clinic and they all kind of know each other's stories and where they are in their treatment. So it really became kind of a referral basis where, you know, we got, you know, through Casey's mom, um, you know, Susan, she said, you know, listen, there's this family, you know, nearby also. And she was just diagnosed with this type of cancer. And um, I said, well, let's go visit, you mm -hmm. know, let's go, let's do it. So I went out and, um, you know, we went out and met with that family and I could kind of evaluate, all right, what are my material costs going to be? The advantage to designers doing this type of work is that, you know, most of us have trade accounts and most of us have accounts with um, trusted vendors that we have relationships with that if we've ordered enough over the years, they'll say, yeah, we can donate a pillow or we can donate this for you or give you a little bit more of a discount um, than you would have to buy on your own. So I guesstimated what we would need, created a GoFundMe, and then I would just kind of sit and wait. And the fundraising, I have to admit, became arduous. It mm -hmm. became um, time consuming. It's hard to ask people for money again and again and again. And it's, and I couldn't, trust myself to start and not be able to fund the room completely and do the things that we needed to do for her brother's room or her sibling's room, um, which we try to include in each of our makeovers. So it, the funding became difficult. And the further along we got into each project, you know, my eyes were bigger than my stomach, right? I wanted to do all of them. And I'm <laughs> like, where am I going to get this money? What, how am I going to do this? Um, and so we'd start different social media campaigns and it really was about a year later when one of my clients uh, during the holidays approached me and said, Susan, I want to help, but I don't want to just help with money. I want to help you raise money in a different way. I want it to make you an official nonprofit. Mm. And um, I said, okay, you do the paperwork. 
(laughs) That's the help. Please do it. (laughs) Yes. You do the paperwork and I will consider it. And so we became an official nonprofit and had our very first fundraiser this last year where we raised a little over 45,000 in an evening. And Mm -hmm. that was really a game changer for us. That's really where um, some of the funding the rooms in a different way came into play. Not to say that you can't do it project by project and you maybe go a little bit slower and you maybe tap into different resources. It can be done and I did it for a solid year, but definitely when you make that choice to become an official nonprofit, it does legitimize the donation base um, a little bit more because you're accountable and and it's tax deductible and all of those things that come along with being a 501c3. And what is, are there criteria for being a nonprofit other than what you just mentioned, knowing that you're going to, you know, file your taxes and, you know, la, la, la. Like, can anybody start a nonprofit? Yes, I believe anybody can start a nonprofit. Um, okay. And like I said, there's a there's a whole bunch of paperwork. Yes, um, which you didn't do. We <laughs> did not do that. <laughs> right. So, but what happens is by doing that, then it, so for instance, I'm going to make a, a, an assumption that what Veronica Solomon is doing is probably not a separate nonprofit, although I have no idea right. and I'd have to ask Veronica. But in other words, any designer of her own volition can donate her services and create a room and everything else. But when you make that transition, now it gives you an ability to solicit money in a different way. Is that what donations in a different way? Okay. Exactly. Exactly. It, it um, allows companies to do matching programs. It allows um, United way to donate part of their employees paychecks that they designate, you know, anything from, you know, smile at, at Amazon, you know, anytime you order anything through Amazon now and you go through our link, then we're recipients of a percentage of the sales. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of different revenue streams that can come from being an official nonprofit. And does the organization that certifies you as a nonprofit, I don't know what part of the government it is, but do they assist you with telling you about those revenue streams? Like, is there a little, no. pro- oh, I was going to say they should give you a little <laughs> booklet and says, here, right? go to Amazon. <laughs> go here and do this. No, I, I literally, I'll sit on the couch watching television and I'll Google up things, you know, how to get monies from a nonprofit, how uh, to apply for a grant, um, wow. you know, and, and again, it goes back to, um, how it is like it could be its own independent business. Right. It could be its own. That's what's really remarkable business. about you, by the right. way. Oh. <laughs> I mean, well, not for nothing. You got three yeah. other businesses and five kids and a husband. I know. <laughs> right. It, 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 it could be. And, and I, you know, and I think one of the things that I want to work on and our goals for the years to come is really, Um, tapping into bigger and better vendor relationships. You know, we have a lot of vendors out there in our field, um, and there are a lot of different really worthy nonprofits that we compete against. Um, And and I'm not saying one is better than the other. They're all very worthy, and they're all very um, uh, deserving of, of vendor donations. But when you look at a company like um, fabric companies or furniture companies and you look at their marketing dollars and how these days with print ads, you know, you're, everything is really social media driven. It, it, there's not a lot of magazine print ads that are all that efficient more than the YouTube and the Instagram and the social media presence that's out there. So my goal really is to find those types of vendors that want to market in a different way and Mm -hmm. want to use the philanthropy channel to say, listen, we'll use our products. We'll get a professional designer to use our products um, in a giving way and be able to give back to our community and at the same time promote our products and why they were chosen for that particular product project. You know, why were they Um, given to that child? Why did we choose this mattress? Um, But it's hard because it's very corporate and you are fighting along with everyone else to get the um, attention to the projects that we're doing. Yes, it's true. I mean, everything you just said in there, I'm just literally here shaking my head up and down because every component of it that the, the the advertising and all of the marketing has changed so dramatically for everybody and especially mm-hmm. for the big guys. And then it is a, a great win-win for a big guy to have their furniture and their product placed in a, in a place that's 
beautiful and also is doing good to not only that individual family, but bringing, you know, notoriety to the organization that's creating that environment for the family, you know, and then to be able to, for you as the designer, to tell the people why you picked this. So for this flooring and la la la, it really is. But then, then the last thing that you said is absolutely a hundred percent true. The corporate slugging through is just brutal. (laughs) Yes, there is. It is just brutal amazing flooring product that we use and I've approached the company dozens of times and said please just anything anything you can donate and I use the product because it's a luxury vinyl and it's a quick installation and it's waterproof and when you're talking so these kids as you may have seen in the video that I had sent earlier a lot of people believe that when these children are diagnosed with cancer, that they spend a lot of time in the hospital, that they're in the hospital during their treatments. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the standard treatment for leukemia, for instance, for girls is two and a half years Mm -hmm. and for boys is three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And they go to the, what they call clinics. And if they make ANC counts, which is their immune system, and they're over a certain number, then they get their next chemo treatment. Now, if they get sick, and their immune system has crashed from the chemo and they wind up with a virus and their body's fighting, fighting, fighting this virus or this cold or this allergen that they have, they get delayed on their chemo treatment. They get pushed off until Mm -hmm. they're better and until their ANC counts come back up. When they get pushed off, there's a greater risk that that leukemia is going to come back and Mm -hmm. become more aggressive. So what we're doing in these rooms is not only making them beautiful and comfortable and pleasing to the eye. But what we're trying to do is through flooring, get, let's get the dust and the allergens out. Let's get surfaces that are super clean and, um, you know, repainted and get all the germs and the, let's, you know, get the little dust bunnies out from under the bed. Let's mm-hmm. get it so that when mom comes in and needs to clean that room for the fifth time that day with antiseptic, that it's, it's easy easily white, to. right? Yes. It's, it's yes. a eggshell finish on your paint and it's a gloss on the baseboards and it's, you know, solid surface flooring and it's a hypoallergenic mattress and bedding and, you know, trying to use those products that are going to minimize them getting sick so that they're not delaying their chemo treatments. They're, you know, with all the time they're spending in their room, making it functional. But going back to the donation process in funding these spaces, we could do so much more and so many more spaces. I've got four designers that work for me. Mm -hmm. I could put them each on a different room if we had the funds and the donation of products to just turn these things around quicker with less cost. And so that's really the goal is to get to that point. And you do have already, I noticed on your website, you have vendors that have committed Mm -hmm. to 100% involvement in every project that you take on. And that's Jeff Lewis, California Closets, Jerome's Mm -hmm. Furniture, Hook and Hand Studio, MKW Graphics, and Glow Photo. So that's yes. pretty significant. They've just said, hey, yeah. if you're doing it, Susan, we're on board. Yes, they have. California Closets has been wonderful. I can throw them pretty much anything, two closets, three closets, a master closet, you know, and they'll say, yeah, we're in. When do you want us? That's um, true. They've been great. Um, so for those vendors, yes, absolutely. Those commitments are super important to us. Well, I have to say, not for nothing, but you are making it easy for them to make a a change in the world. I I mean, I'm going to be real because anytime an interior designer calls me to be part of a show house, every show house is connected to some sort of a charity, right? Anytime Mm -hmm. Pat Ziv calls me, you know, because she wants to do something with Make-A-Wish, I am there for two reasons. I say yes to every single one of them, every request that comes my way for two reasons. Number one, out of respect to the designer, that individual designer that has brought me business and I have worked side by side with for one year, one month, 20 years, whatever it is. But also Mm -hmm. two, you know, quite selfishly, I get to say to myself, okay, we helped. You know what I mean? Because I'm not the one that's going out of my way to make this project happen. But I feel like, oh, thank you. I feel like... I remember the second time Pat asked me to donate. She's like, I don't want you to feel obligated. You did it the last time. She said, I just asking. And if you want to say no, no. And I'm like, Pat, ask me every time. I'm so happy. 
happy yeah. that and I we could. We're grateful for people like you. Well, that's the, because, like I said, I feel like I'm grateful to her that she's giving me a chance, and I don't have to do anything more than show up, measure, and send an installer to deliver. And that <laughs> sounds so cold, and that's my point. I feel like yeah. you're getting something, you're you're creating something, and that yes, you be thankful to the vendor. But I know as the vendor, you're giving us an opportunity to do something that we don't get out of our busy day maybe to, to do and to make the, that right. happen. So I, I understand it from both sides and I just think it's remarkable. And, but when you talk about the level of what California closets is doing, and I'm sure this Jerome's furniture, that's their, I'm sure there's some significant donations. Uh, they were. Jerome's helped us out a little bit with some mattresses and some furniture. But again, all of those things come to an end. Um, and so even with Jerome's, there's been um, a little bit of pushback and that, OK, we've helped. And now who's next? Who, okay. who else is going to step up to the plate? So um, I would say that, you know, maintaining those... Uh, as a nonprofit, so standing in the shoes as both a designer and as a the founder of the nonprofit, I can say that I walk this line between my social media presence is going to be celebrating these families, celebrating the rooms. The other thing that's been huge and we can touch on also is fund and needs, which I think is really critical when you're in your social media community is the fund and needs, which are um, I'll go into in a minute. But it's really straddling that line being wanting to be appreciative and wanting to give the feedback and the acknowledgement and the thank yous to the vendors. And at the same time, where do you draw that line? And it's a big struggle because you want to show how appreciative you are and you want to shout out a lot of these business sponsors. But at the at the same time, there is sometimes an expectation that, well, we didn't get really our return on our donation, so we're not going to donate oh, anymore. Oh, see, that's, that, see, I don't, and I don't, me personally, I never look at it that way. I've never right, gotten exactly. a return on it. It doesn't matter. So, <laughs> that's not why I'm doing right. it. <laughs> exactly. And that's what I want. I want those vendors that... <laughs> You know, although they may be redirecting some of their marketing dollars or feel like they might be able to use some of the photographs or anything on their website to promote their product, they're doing it for the right reasons. They're doing it because ultimately you're doing it for not for me. Right. Uh, I'm just the conduit. Right. You're doing it for these kids right. and you're doing it for these families. And so and, you know, with the feedback from the families is overwhelming at times. Mm. I mean, the, the um, level of um, uh appreciative yeah. or gratitude yeah. yeah is is so great because they um they so badly want to do something to help their child and to see the joy on their children's faces mm -hmm. when they feel like so helpless as a parent is um they said it's just overwhelming so it's got the, to be that's amazing. that's yes. why we're doing it yes so well and and are you is there you you are accepting donations through the nonprofit yeah. so is it a mm -hmm. is it is it something where some of the vendors could get a partial payment for some of it, or you need certain vendors yeah. to donate because other things like, I don't know, whatever else has to be paid for. I don't know. There are certain things that have to be paid for. Like um, you go into I a had, retail store and you got to buy a bedspread, right. Bed Bath & Beyond well, isn't just, well, I guess they this, probably could too, right? Right. Well, this seems kind of silly, but you know, I try to do a room about every six weeks, four to six weeks. And I would say that there are certain things. I talked with Lisa, who's the founder of Dwell, um, and dwell in dignity out of Texas. She has a nonprofit. Yes. I just and, met her at design bloggers. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. And I, I had a chance to talk to her, but I had spoken to her last October and kind of interviewed her when I was thinking of being a nonprofit. And it was about a year ago. I just talked to her and she was telling me all sorts of things. And she says, my biggest piece of advice is don't use volunteer painters. <laughs> 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 Whatever you do, don't use a volunteer painter. So there are certain things that, yes, they're not the fun <laughs> things, right? I'm going to pay a painter to go in there and paint yes. um, because I can control his schedule. I can control his quality. Good point. And my painters live paycheck to paycheck. So, you know, God right. love them. They give me discounts whenever they can. And they charge me a very, very, very reasonable rate. But I'm going to pay for my painter to right. go in there. So there are things that I have to. But the one thing I discovered this past year, which I find so profound for any designer that's looking to do this within their community, is on the group page, I started um, a fund a need when I start a room. 
and I will find an item that I want to purchase for this particular room. And instead of me going and buying it and having it and not telling anybody, I will post the item on my page and say, I'm looking for somebody that might want to sponsor this set of sheets or somebody that want, might want to sponsor this lamp or something, somebody that might want to sponsor this accent pillow. Um, and I've had so much success with that approach. And I think psychologically as givers, all of us want to look at a picture of a room and go, oh, I contributed that. Much more willing to contribute an actual item than an actual cash donation. Because so many of us, I think, feel like we don't know where it's going, right? You're exactly. going to give $50. I don't know where it's going to go. Is it going to go to an admin? Is it going to go to their lunch? What, you know, what's it going to go to? And I can tell you with the funds that are donated, we have like 99% of it goes to product. Mm -hmm. um, and the funds, the funded needs that we do, I will give them my ship address. I will say, this is what I want. This is what size I need. And less than five minutes later, I will get a response. Wow. I, it is unbelievable, this community of people that we have. They go over above and beyond. I mean, I, I'm blown away continually because people will kind of comment after and say, oh my gosh, I missed it again. <laughs> I you was know? just thinking and you probably have three people that are online sending it all at the same time and you get 20 lamps. Like, they, they comment right away and they go, I got this one. I got this you one. Ship it to your Clean office. It. You know? And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so unbelievable. And there are days when I will put five funding needs out and I will get all of them. Yes. I, I'm so not surprised because it's, it is, you are exactly right about that, Susan, is there is something so much more tangible about mm -hmm. giving something that you know exactly Exactly what it is. I like yes. I said to you before our interview, I have been for almost five years looking for an entrepreneurial organization that is a um, nonprofit that speaks and works and cultivates teen either high school or college or both. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I've come across places where I could send them a check. And of course, there's not that many, by the way, but I've come, but I want one where I can be involved. And yes, I will send money and I will raise money, but I'm really, so I'm putting it out there. If anybody knows right. of one, yeah. you know, but I just feel like that's my thing. I love business. I love entrepreneurship. And, you know, it's, there's something when you can tangibly connect what you're doing to what you're giving. And so I could see that even though I'm describing my passion for business and wanting to connect in a giving way there, if I'm on your Facebook page and you're like, Hey, I need this lamp. I would probably be way more inclined to just click and go, you know what? I can do that five seconds. Let me just do that for her because right. it does feel tangible and that's yes. brilliant on your part. I love yeah. that. It's, and then this way you get amazing. the piece you want. You don't have to, you don't even mm -hmm. have to go shopping for it now. That's I know. <laughs> That's the best part. My admin, my buyer loves me. She shows it. up at the store all the time and she's like, okay, these lamps showed up. I'm like, great. I'll come get them. That's so, terrific. It's awesome. yeah. Now you said something else way back there that I don't think I realized when I was researching you. You, if the child that you're creating the space for has siblings, you do the siblings yes. rooms as well. We do. And we found that, you know, and it started with the very, I mean, the I very, can see why, but right off the yes. bat, I can see why, but I'm curious. Yeah. How you... <laughs> well, when there's an identified child that's sick and requires so much time and attention and time at the hospital with mom and dad and doctor's appointments and everything, sometimes the siblings get kind of left behind. Mm -hmm. And although they may not need the same level of function that their sibling needs, they still want to come home to a place where they can be themselves and be in their space and have it work for them. And so what we do is we try to allocate, you know, we kind of came up with a budget for each, each space, each family, and we allocate about three quarters of that budget to the primary child and about, um, you know, quarter to the secondary. So for instance, if we have, you know, most of the rooms, our costs are 6500 or so to do a child's room at cost with our donations. And then we put maybe another 3500 25 to 3500 into a sibling's room. Um, and it's kind of waxed and waned based a lot about what the child needs. I mean, if they don't need new floors, we don't put in new floors. And if we um, can get away with the same color of paint, maybe do we do one coat of paint on their, on their walls. But we found that it really helps with the bonding of those siblings and being able to um, treat it as a whole family 
dynamic and not just we're here for your sick child. (laughs) You know, that really is a a remarkable part of it, I have to say, because it is true. My, I actually have my niece here. She was diagnosed with leukemia in actually the day after Thanksgiving of 2015 and she was four years old. And so it's exactly the trajectory that you described. She's about 16 months into it and they said the same thing. This will be a two and a half year process. All last year she was out of school. I guess she was five years old and now she's six. She was out Mm -hmm. of school and she had just started a new school as a kindergartner in a new town. So that was very difficult. But, um, and thankfully she's doing very very well and she generally is always hitting her numbers and she's really really a beautiful remarkable child and my niece and nephew her parents are amazing but then there's her brother and of course thankfully my brother and sister-in-law who are the grandparents you know are in the same town and always going out of their way to do something special with with her sibling while this Mm -hmm. happens and that happens, but that I could see that dynamic just being one more, instead of it being, well, and okay. So that person's special to now this way, not understanding as a child that nobody wants to be special that way. Right. Right. But it is another separator. And the fact that you consider that and the fact that you actually, because that whole extra layer to the project. It's, (laughs) you know, but I can imagine how appreciated it would be, even if the, the sibling who is the well sibling doesn't quite understand it as a child. I know the parents would understand the value yes. of that. It's all because yeah. I could almost see my niece and nephew being, well, I don't know because I, it'd be great to have her room so fabulous, but then that's just a, another separator and, and that yes. you take that off of their plate. They don't have to deny their child, you know, exactly. that. And of course, like you said, some of the needs aren't as high level needs. You don't have quite the need for the, flooring and the different things in a well child's room. Exactly. Exactly. Very so we kind of try to customize it to each, each child and each family of what they need and what it is that we're trying to accomplish for that family. It really is something else. I mean, I am absolutely in awe of what you have created. I mean, and we didn't even talk about your entire design business, but yo, know, oh, I know what I want to do before I let you go though. I did ask you how at this point, and I think that's how you got into the t- telling us how it's a nonprofit. So there must be something in that angle. How at this point, when you've become so well known and you are a nonprofit, Look, doing a a child every six weeks is a tremendous schedule, but how Mm -hmm. do you decide who's next and who gets to, to receive this tremendous gift from you and your firm? Because the need is way greater than what you can possibly do. It is. It is. And it's, so we sit, we have our board meetings and we have a board of directors and we have, um, uh, Casey's mom, who was our first recipient, um, her mom sits and and is kind of our liaison for the different families. So Mm -hmm. when we get a request or somebody reaches out to us, then it goes through Susan Harvey and she um, tell, you know, we look for different things. How long is the treatment going to be? Where are you in your treatment process? Um, You know, we have to assess their overall risk for infection. Can they have contractors in their home Mm -hmm. at this time? Are they too risky to have people in and out of their house? Are they too sick? Um, there are certain things that we're going to look for. And then, then I, I mean, I've got a couple kids I've offered to do spaces and so excited, but they're in rentals and they're looking to move in the next couple months. And they said, I, we just can't right now. And it kills me because mm-hmm. I would be there in a heartbeat, you know, but I, so we, we have a list. I would love to get through them quicker. Uh, a lot of it comes down to finances, being able to, um, make sure that we have the funds to accommodate each room. But, you know, my long-term goal is I, I, I'm opening the door to other designers across the country. I mean, if, if Savvy Giving by Design, we've figured it out, so to speak, and we've got the resources and we've got the formula of how to do it. And if another designer, you know, has a community member or somebody close to them, if we had the resources and we had the funds, I'll fly out and I'll say, let's, let's do this and let, let that designer design it up and help fund it and be out there to, to supervise. And obviously, 
you know, make sure the quality of mentor them through the process and everything else. So, I mean, I would love to be able to host different designers in every state. I get because you're not busy enough yet. Oh, I know. Well, (laughs) you know, in my in my dream life, you know, I would do this. We're adding travel to fifty states, right? Um, You got to watch what you say. This podcast is in one hundred twenty (laughs) countries. You know, you're going to be getting people from Canada and England and you know China calling you, going, "Hey." That's that's the crux of the whole situation, though, right, Luann? If it were a financial Uh security there were financial security to be able to help fund and know the only reason I would say no is because of the finances. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything else can be worked out. You Mm -hmm. know, I, I love the balance of my job right now as a designer. I love doing construction and I love remodels and my room design. I've limited to basically the nonprofit. I don't do a lot of room design outside of the nonprofit because I'm so focused on paying the bills and doing the remodels. But Um, You know, that's my balance. That's my great balance is Mm -hmm. to, you know, live in construction land and all of the frustrations that come along with that and then turn around and be very grounded in being able to work with these families. And I get so attached to these families and um, love visiting them and love getting pictures from them in their spaces. Those are the best pictures I ever get are when they're actually living in their spaces. It's got to be. You said something to me before we started recording about... Mm -hmm. The, the, on top of just like you just described, the joy of giving and the joy of seeing the children and the family so happy, you said something, there was another aspect of it that you really loved and you thought was a great balance as a designer. And I want to mm-hmm. remind you to share that with everybody. I think that regardless of what philanthropic efforts as a designer you move towards, it could be, I've met a lot of designers that have done different things. Some build little tiny houses for seniors. Others um, help women transitioning out of homelessness into homes. Um, So many really wonderful ways to lend our talents to um, that nonprofit community or to a giving community. I think what happens is when we start out as designers, we are people pleasers, I think, by nature. We, we want to make people happy. And through our profession that we've chosen, we use design and decor as a way to, we want people to come in and have that aha moment that, wow, oh my gosh, I love it. You know, I, it's changed my life. I feel so much happier in my space now. And that's what we're really going for. And as the years go by, I think a little bit of cynicism gets in there and we get some clients, a small percentage, not all of them. Most of them are lovely, but they, we get into kind of our interior design bubble where we're working with a certain population. And when we're paying for design, there's a lot of emotion wrapped up into Mm -hmm. it. And sometimes our perspective can get skewed as far as, you know, the piping on a chair isn't perfectly straight and it's very upsetting and the chair has to go back. And why did that chair (laughs) come in anyway? And how could we possibly live like this? How could we have, how could you have ordered that for me? You know, or how could this happen? Or, you know, this dialogue came in different. How could that happen? You mean I have to wait two more weeks for my carpet? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's very agitating. And when you work in a nonprofit sector, and you're working with a population that wouldn't otherwise maybe hire a designer or be in that bubble, and you see how appreciative they are of something that really changes and alters their space, it's it's very grounding. It kind of brings you back and says, okay, this is your priorities. Their priority is their child who's sick, who's got to be back at the hospital again because they've spiked a fever or just got their steroids and are super grumpy and crying all day. Mm. This brings you back to why you do what you do. And you're doing it because you're trying to help someone. You're doing it because you're trying to make their lives a little better through design and through your talent. And it's very grounding. And that's why I really think that every designer out there has got to find something, some way of giving of their talents that doesn't It's not related to money and not related to a certain population, but related to truly the gift of your talent, because that's really what's going to, it's going to hone in on your design. It's going to allow you a little bit more creativity and a little bit more freedom Mm. without approvals of, you know, this budget or that budget. You get to try a few new different things. You get to do a few new different things and lend your talents to something that will bring you back to why you got into it for the first place. 
I love it. I love it because there's no question that it takes a tremendous amount of work and effort on your part to to do all of this. But what I'm hearing is you're also getting something from it more oh, than what we expected, the face value of the joy of it. It really yes. informs you as an interior designer, what you're saying. And I, I even thought that was interesting in there that you get to do design and try ideas and things that you don't need somebody's approval to do. And that's a oh, benefit as an interior designer. That's huge. I have to say that's probably uh, selfishly. I think that's the most fun is because with most of my rooms, I don't disclose everything I'm going to do. And if at the last minute I need to change lights because they don't work or right. I don't like them in the space, I don't have to get anybody's approval. I right. just do it. Or you see and something more fabulous nice. or a different yes. idea. It's like a show house in that regard. It's your, yeah. your imagination is the limit. Exactly. Yes. And I always trying it. to come up with something new or different that you want to try. And, you know, we did a room uh, not too long ago. She had a really funky closet and we did big old chalkboard barn doors. Oh, and I saw bookshelf. that. I saw oh, that. It was fabulous. Oh. And, you know, for something like that, most of, you know, most of our clients may not be able to visualize it or gosh, do I really want to go to that expense for a closet or, mm-hmm. and being able to get a vendor to make those and donate them and get creative with me <sighs> and another vendor to come out and do all the lettering for me. At no you know, cost. it's funny that and you it, said that because I looked at that. I thought I literally, Susan, I literally looked at, it, I thought, who wrote all that? <laughs> I'm like, right? that's a skill yeah. right there. I'm like, did yeah. Susan sit there and write all that so neatly and so artistically? No, I, I absolutely. <laughs> I have a very dear friend of mine who Lake House Designs, I'll shout her out. She does all of the lettering for our community down here. And I called her in in a heartbeat. She donates. That's... Um, She's also the same one that did that big solar system in that last room oh, that we did. Yes. She's incredibly talented. That's amazing. That's really yeah. funny that you actually yeah. brought that up because I literally had that. I thought, I thought, who made that look so <laughs> I'm like, that's ours. <laughs> and it's so fun because you get to do different things like mm-hmm. that and without them knowing, and then they're blown away by the oh, details. Yeah. I mean, I have to say when they come in and they see those little types of details, they are so thrilled because mm. it's so custom to them. All of those quotes were custom to little Kate. Oh. And so um, it was super special to be able to do that. It really, what you do is super special. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And I, I really would love for you out there listening, once you have taken a moment to look at what Susan is doing, I'd love for you to, you know, reach out, give her a high five, certainly donate, help her any way you can. But also, I am I would like to know, on the day that Susan's show goes live, of course, you all know that we'll feed pictures five, six, seven times during the day through Instagram and Facebook and Twitter about the guest. So I want, I would come back to me and let me know if you were even one half as impressed by Susan as I was because <laughs> it's, I just... I don't know. I'm really in a little bit of awe. I think what you're doing, and I'm going to repeat this. It'll be the third time I'm going to say it, but I think it bears repeating. I think if what you were doing and you were a single woman, a single, you know, a single woman with a business and this was your life's mission, that would be incredible enough. But to think about <laughs> everything on your plate, my brain it just yeah. spins at it. <laughs> well, I have a lot of good people. I mean, I think the key to all of that really is surrounding yourself with a good team. I yes. mean, that's all you can do is, is, you know, there's no one person that can do it all. I certainly couldn't do this in isolation. The community that I have behind us and social media has been tremendous. Mm. Um, I I couldn't do it without them. I mean, I tell them that all the time is that I am the conduit and I'm the person that maybe does the actionable items and can put the room together. But without all of the donations and the people supporting and the wanting to help and the volunteering and, you know, my, my uh, right-hand guy, uh, Michael, who does uh, all of our electrical and helps me set up every room every time Mm. for every reveal. I mean, without him, I I couldn't do it. So it does take a team and you surround yourself with enough good people and it makes you look good. Yes. No, (laughs) it's the truth. Well, you're looking really good, Susan. I got to tell you. (laughs) And, I, you know what? I think it's amazing that you're interesting. You're interested in mentoring and help, like you said, host other designers across the country to possibly duplicate what you're doing. Do yeah. do me a favor. Put mm-hmm. tell us your what your websites and how they contact you if they're interested in donating or in trying to start up something in their own community. Yeah, I think. Um, well, our website. Our main website for the nonprofit is SavvyGivingByDesign.org, and that's Savvy with two V's as in Victor. Um, Savvy Giving by Design is there, and then also we've got uh, some YouTube videos that they can check out, and we're also on Instagram at, at Savvy Giving by Design. 
Um, I would love, you know, whether it's this nonprofit and getting involved and doing what we're doing, and there's other organizations across the country that do similar, not a lot of designers, but a lot of other uh, people that have cropped up to do some room makeovers and things like that. It, anything really that designers want to do, I would love to talk to you. I'd love to have a group or a coalition of interior designers that are giving back. And I actually even started a smaller little group page. I think I've got maybe, I don't know, 20 some of us on there. Not even sure, again, when things happen by accident, where we're going to go with that. <laughs> but I would love to, I, I want to know what people are doing. I want to know, I want to be that person that says, yeah, go out and do something. I don't know if you're crazy so or just fantastic. I really don't. <laughs> uh, probably a little both. I know. Because I... I, you're really now starting yet another thing. You have just announced it on this podcast that you are like, you know, <laughs> open to a coalition of all of us. And we're, you know, we're all going to be like, yeah, yeah come on, I'm in. <laughs> but similar to what you were talking about with the entrepreneurship, you know, being able to share ideas, I think is powerful. And unfortunately, there are very few communities within interior design where we share our knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Where we share what's worked for you. I don't know. Did this work for you? This works for me. Right. And it's hard to find that within our community because I think all of us, there are a lot of people that work on their own and mm -hmm. don't have teams. And there's a, a fear sometimes that, you know, maybe there's a competition or I, I don't know what it is. All I know is that from a giving perspective, I would love to see designers helping designers. Oh, this is what I'm doing in my community. Do you want to come help next weekend? Yes. You know, or have you thought about doing this? Or, you know, all of us designers have, gosh, leftover inventory, lamps, rugs. Okay, let's all throw them online, sell them and donate it. Right, you know, let's right, right, right. do something that's going to pay it forward. Um, not so much paying it back, but go forward with it. Yes. You know, if you, something's been kind, it's been done to you, turn around and do something nice for someone else. Right. Um, don't feel the need to thank that person and go forward with right. it. And so I think it's just super important that all of us share that information of what we're doing to lend our talents because it really, like I said, brings you back selfishly to your core of why you got into the field, yes. why you're a designer, why it is, what makes you happy about doing it. It's the creativity, it's the helping others, it's the pleasing, it's the, all of those things wrapped up. Yeah, it's amazing. And you know, it's funny, you've said something in there, makes me think I'll have to find out. You know, of course, that uh, Cherish is one of the sponsors of the podcast on a Brockway's right. company. And I just... I, I, I just, as you were saying that we all have, you know, inventory of old this and, you know, not even the old, but just right. left over or whatever. I wonder if there is a donation arm within Cherish. I don't even know. That would be amazing. Wouldn't I, that be? I, it, it would. Even on our Savvy Steals, people will throw things up and say, with a donation to Savvy Giving by Design. You mm -hmm. know, they'll throw up their items that they're selling and they don't want the money. They just want it to go to the nonprofit and right. that's their way of contributing. So, yeah, if Cherish had a nonprofit arm where people or designers could donate some of their things and take the tax write off right. and sell it, and that would benefit yeah. Savvy Giving, then that's a win win for everyone. Yeah, well, we might just yeah. have to get everybody all hooked up yeah. together. <laughs> <laughs> I love okay. it. Okay. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I really yeah. do appreciate your time, Susan, in spending Thank it with you. us today and telling us all about this remarkable thing that you have created. And I'm so amazed and awed that you're willing to take emails and phone calls for people to pick your brain and, and duplicate it and everything else. But, um, yeah. and I also just want to say too, we didn't spend five seconds really on your other companies, but I do want to yes. just point out how clever you have named all your companies. So your <laughs> interior you. design firm is Savvy Interiors. And then you actually right. have a retail store that sells yes. furniture and accessories in yes. your free time called Inside by Savvy. And then, of course, yes. SavvyGivingByDesign.org. And I just yeah. think it's very clever and um, obviously very well thought out. So thank you. Yes. Thank you thank so you. much. I appreciate your being here. And I look forward to, you know, figuring out ways to help you do what you do, because I'm awesome. really very impressed. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Luann. I really appreciate the opportunity. We love your podcast and I listen to it religiously. So thank you for being such a spokesperson for the industry. Thank you. Thank you. My thanks to My Doma Studio, one of our podcast sponsors. What is My Doma Studio? Well, you know, as busy interior designers, that running your own design firm isn't just about designing. 
There's managing contracts, clients, payments, products, and a million other things you're expected to be the master of and have control over. That's where My Doma Studio comes in. I'd like to invite you to try My Doma Studio. Go to mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business. You'll see why designers around the world are using My Doma Studio. My Doma Studio helps you organize the business end of your design firm so that you can spend time focusing and doing what you love, which is designing. Visit mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business today. And for listeners of the podcast, if you go to mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business, you will see that My Doma Studio has a special offer just for you. So Susan can sort of make you feel like you're sitting still, can't she? <laughs> I don't know, man. That's a lot on somebody's plate. But seriously, how wonderful is this organization that she has created? The many families whose lives her team and her are changing. You have to go on her website, www dot savvy giving by design dot org and look at the stories about the children and watch the videos of the room reveals and watch the faces of these kids it's really something else to see just incredible and I want to mention just a couple of things about this interview from a business perspective I didn't ask Susan directly about the details of how her three separate businesses run but couldn't we probably all just agree it goes without saying that she must have strictly organized systems for all three businesses, the design firm, the retail store, and the nonprofit. How else could you imagine getting all of these things done, you know, executing a new project every six weeks for just the nonprofit alone, then add to that the two other businesses that you need to keep humming along and earning an income for your family and your employees while you do these projects. So, I'm going to just go out on a limb here and say if Susan has found a way to systemize three separate entities, I'm pretty sure you can figure out a way to, to systemize your single firm. It just takes a decision to commit to do it. Another decision you could think about committing to is to either donate to Susan's organization or take her up on her offer to help her help you duplicate her program in your area. Things to think about. So to learn more about Susan, you can go to her website or you can ask to join her Facebook group, Savvy Giving by Design. Maybe at a minimum, you'll just be in the group and you'll see the um, opportunity for the fund and need specials. I think um, that would be pretty fun and I'm sure it would be appreciated by Susan as well. Thank you for joining me again today. Please remember you can easily join our email list and receive our weekly newsletter about all the comings and goings around the podcast by simply taking your phone out and texting Design Biz, D E S I G N B I Z, to the number 444 999. That's 444 999. Easy as pie. And you'll be in the, in, the know of all the things that we're doing here. And also don't forget to check out our website, www.windowworks-nj.com. Head over to our To The Trade tab. We have blog posts there about the business issues that you are facing and expanded content on the things I learned uh, from the various guests and all of the pictures from our party in New York City where you can see the video and the pictures. The guests are there of Taylor Spellman, Vanessa DeLeon, Deborah Rosenberg of Cruelty Free Design, Gail Davis. Everybody's there. Um, the photographer for the night was Joe Peoples, and he did an excellent job. And the videos, of course, for the night were done by Room 2 Productions, my Uncle Bill and Aunt Gretchen. So thanks so much for joining me today. Have an excellent day. Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. This podcast is a production of Window Works in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about Window Works at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events. 